Good morning, Doug. Hi, John. How are you? I'm pretty good. Good. Yeah. Oh, let's see. Am I open yet? There I am. Here you are. Yeah. <laughs> so, the journey continues. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Um, harder to describe each day, I think. Yes, yes. What seemed like, like the summit of complexity keeps going up. <laughs> <laughs> right. Although, you know, and if often complex systems are not seen for what they are, so they could actually be getting simpler, but they look more complicated. Right, right. More smoke, but maybe less fire. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> or different kinds of fire at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We could keep milking these metaphors and have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Are you on the list for uh, Jack's uh, speculations about um, quests and games? Um, no, I don't think so. Jack, okay. which one? Jack Park. Oh, uh, I'm not. Okay. Uh, I just I got really one. Like Jack, but I have trouble with his point of view. Which yeah. Which is that there are elements of uh, truth that remain constant, even if situations change. Oh, the, the, uh, he's, his point of view is the truth. That's interesting. That the tr I hadn't framed it that way. That the truth remains constant, but the situations change? Well, the atoms of truth rem are definable, and then they can be reassembled, but they don't change their own qualities. And uh, so it's a, you know, it's building up a knowledge uh, garden, uh, one plant at a time, and those plants maintain their uh, integrity if you rearrange them. And I just don't believe that's the way it works. I believe that larger layers of, of meaning affect everything underneath them. So if you change the general point of view, all the particular facts change their quality and tone. Yeah, at a minimum, their, their tone and emphasis, but also perhaps something more fundamental. Yeah, right. They're very yeah. significant. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, we're all we're all trapped by our experience. I try to think about how we did this kind of layered scenario planning where we started with events and then had selection from events. But then of course, of course, the, the, what, the, what a team did was change the meaning of the events. That was, what, that was their task, was to thread the events with a narrative that changed their implications and emphasize some things and de-emphasize other things. And then that was the thing they presented as, as a hypothesis, that that particular way of looking at the emphasis made more sense than another way. But, I mean, almost everybody uh, looks for some foundation on yeah. which to build their point of view, but there is none. It, it, yeah, there's nothing that you can put a stake right, so in there, unless, you're, is, unless you're going to get conventionally religious or something. Right. Uh, Good morning. Good morning, Stacy. Hi, Stace. Hello. This is my favorite topic. Keep going. I'm listening. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> How would you name your favorite topic? I don't think I could name my favorite topic. What I could say is that I look for the little shifts that could be made in everything. And I just want to yeah, throw that yeah. little sparkle point in because I think it's all there. Just needs the teeniest, tiniest little tweak. Jerry, what we're talking about is the problem. Most people look for a foundation for their point of view. Mm -hmm. And there is none. There's only the points of view. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in my brain, I have a thought called people are born good, and it is opposite people are born bad or evil or somehow one down, like original sin. 
And I have made a personal decision that people are born good and then shit happens. And that is a foundational belief for me, atop which I can then say, hey, that's why we should trust first. And that's why assume good intent. And that's why a whole bunch of other stuff. So how is that not a counterexample? Well, because the question is whether it's true or not. Oh, I don't care. That's a foundational <laughs> belief for me. Okay, so I do care because I can construct a, a construct construct a reasonable edifice for behaving differently if you start with that assumption. I but, totally but agree. Why do you talk the, about truth? In, one can believe in something that's not uh, true and act on it, and it'll everything goes well. It's a, it's and actually it's, a self fulfilling prophecy, and when you treat absolutely. people with suspicion, yep. that's a self fulfilling prophecy as well. Usually, and when you infantilize people and treat them as if they're not very smart they will often behave in really stupid ways. So it's, it's like right. how, how you right. enter a conversation really matters. And that seems foundational to me. Um, Stace, uh, Gil and Stacy, sorry, just to <laughs> look at people. Uh, sorry, it's, it, it, it's hard to not just jump in. <laughs> I know, isn't it? It's fun. It's my hand and stuff like that. Um, I, I got a problem with what both of you are saying. Doug, I don't know why you're talking about truth because we're in a realm, we're not in a realm of truth here, number one. Jerry, you say people are born good and then shit happens, but you act with people as though you're encountering them before all that shit happened. Not really, I don't know what you mean. No, I'm acting, I'm acting with people as if, they've, as if we've all been through shit and I don't know your shit. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm not assuming that you're good and innocent and everything's like groovy. I'm, I'm also assuming that if you were to insult me or something like that, I should absorb it and go, there's probably a reason for that and I can inquire within. Mm -hmm. And that's really different from taking offense and sending, like putting out a hit on you, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is less friendly. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, but does that make sense? Oh yeah. Um, Stacy. Right, so for me, what you and Doug said actually matches because if you're assuming that everybody is good, then you also have to recognize that whatever opinion they've come to was formed by the way they connected the dots right so you're both right <laughs> and it has to go together instead of separating it's not yeah and my and my assume good intent statements are not meant to be a blanket everybody's good things are groovy we should just sort of innocently you know uh, be naive i mean there's a couple of bad actors out there, but we, we misinterpret them, we mishandle them, and we design all of our systems to prevent them from acting bad. And that, that, has, Sorry. And that has actually ask? screwed up our world a lot. Go ahead, Stacey. Do, do most people believe here that somebody doing something that we might think is evil, do you think that most people, if they don't have some sort of pathology, believe that what they're doing is for good? Very often. Very often, very often things that we think are evil, people are doing for a reason that they consider to be good. Yes, I, I totally agree with that. They have reasoning, uh, and the reasoning might only be that everybody around me is doing the same thing. And that's, that's really powerful. When everybody who lives near you is doing precisely the same thing, you can't imagine taking the other point of view. It's it, because nobody, nobody in the world seems to hold that point of view, right? For example, just as a little example, Sorry, we, we jumped right in. I, I, I fell into a conversation and then we like took off from there. And this is cool. Uh, and we're having a really nice frothy conversation on the, on the Google group as well, which I really like. Uh, What's interesting is how far this conversation has migrated from where John Kelly and I started. Which was uh, talking about toffee? We were talking about the fact that m most people in life want to find a foundation outside of their thinking to ground their thinking. And there is no such foundation. Well, there are many that pose as such, like religions. Of course. Yeah, but, but you're saying there is no truth. I, I don't know that you're saying there is no truth, but you're saying there is no solid foundation like that. There's no solid foundation that remains constant across all your thinking. You mean that you mean that will consistently support all your thinking? How do you mean that? No, it's just that, that people want atoms of truth out of which to build structures. Some people want uh, eaves of we truth. We started with Jack Park, who believes that. Um, out of which you can assemble reasoning. I mean, uh, there's a bunch of people who devoted a whole lot of time to logic, and and 
disciplines built on logic like mathematics and and astronomy and whatnot uh, or, or other sciences, and they're trying to put together an edifice of, of pieces that fit together on top of foundational pieces, right? And 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 then every now and then they show up and they're like, well, damn, there's like we don't we have no ninety percent of the matter in the universe appears to be dark matter. We have no good clue what that is. Gosh, we need a better we need a better foundational theory. But science is kind of the act of replacing your foundations as you move forward in a way. But it's heavily contested <clears throat> because. Oh. We People like to hang on to their foundation, right? I mean, yeah. this is this is uh, I mean an overriding, overarching phenomenon. People are tribal and 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 want to stay within uh, their tribal context. So you have religions competing for truth when none of them make any sense in regard to scientific truth. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Um, in fact, I'll add I'll add a tiny cynical note, and then I'll sort of take us back to starting the call, kind of more toward intro. Um, uh, oh, shoot, what was I about to say? You, you Science said, progresses one funeral at a time. That's, that's entirely too true. Um, oh, um, so for me, and this is only my perspective, acts of faith, like believing in a virgin birth and the whole catechism of the Catholic Church, for example, are very explicitly attempts to have you agree to things that are counterfactual, that are counterlogical, that are counterscientific. And in so doing, you achieve membership in the group, in the tribe. And so, and so the, the cost of membership in the tribe is renunciation of the dominance of other sorts of logical systems in some sense. Um, and that's really powerful. Like it's incredibly powerful. Yeah. Um, so, and we're trying to have our chat on the Mattermost chat, but not everybody is on the Mattermost chat. Uh, I just, um, oh shoot, there we go. Um, I just uh, I just want to recognize that Paul Crafell is with us and I'm thrilled about that. Um, uh, so back a hundred years ago, uh, Arthur Brock sent me this grainy VHS quality video of a fellow who was walking around the, the hillsides of Northern California with a hand trowel, fixing the hillsides by paying attention to the action of water on the hillsides. Um, that was Paul. And Paul is a teacher and uh, has done a whole bunch of really cool stuff, a hero of mine. Uh, and his idea of upward spiral has infected my brain uh, and sort of uh, really influenced a lot of the things that I think about over time. So I just wanna say thank you for, for joining the calls. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I, got a, I got an email from Paul recently that said, I Googled my own name because I wanna get out sort of in the world a little bit. I Googled my own name and yours, yours is the first one that showed up. So he sent me a cold email and said, hi, uh, I'm the upward spiral guy. And I, I was like, holy God, this is like Lionel Messi calling you out to kick around the ball. Um, sorry, Paul, you're muted locally, uh, I think. Or are you saying anything? Um, can you hear me? You're fine. I, we hear you just fine. Yeah, I just, uh, good morning, and I'm having my bowl of cereal. And uh, it's a beautiful day in Northern California. Love that. So, and so thank you for being here. I will I will go around the room. You'll see, I'll, I'll go around the room and just ask people to check in on what things they're doing that are kind of OGM-like, OGME, we call it. Uh, we are way overrepresented on men here and white men, which is not good. We're trying to shift our, our group. I just want to point that out with alarm, um, even though I love all of you, because uh, I think these conversations are important, and I, I would love to address that during our call as well. Okay. Um, yeah. Pardon? I cannot help you on that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, and if we all showed up next week cross-dressing, I'm not sure that would help either. Uh, although it would be really, really amusing. But if we all if we all showed up with one guest who is not like us, that would be interesting too. That's correct, and that's a really nice mechanism for 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 getting there. And uh, in the Mattermost chat, Bentley made a really, really lovely suggestion that I would love to pick up on as well uh, for how to do that. Uh, and so I think we can direct our attentions that away. Um, and uh, so uh, our normal rhythm on Thursdays, this, this is not meant to be a, a call with an aim toward deliverables and work product and end goals. This is just a community check-in call where we figure out what we care about, what we're working on that has to do with open global mind, mm -hmm. whatever that means. Uh, and I walk through my grid, kind of uh, letting people 
uh, take us wherever they want to take us. And then occasionally they, they, they'll put something in the room that, that like is, is hot or is interesting or is particularly connective. And we will dive into that and sort of try to unpack it and help one another uh, sort through these things. Um, so in that spirit, uh, let me, um, let me actually, Doug, you've been like last way too often. So, and you just, you and John just started a, a really cool and interesting conversation. So let me actually start with uh, Doug, John, and Stacy. Well, um, I'm feeling fairly tongue-tied recently because the situation is so complicated, it's hard to know what to say. I think I've got uh, two thrusts to my own thinking. One is that we're on the Titanic and we've already hit the iceberg. Uh, that's one perspective, but that doesn't lead anywhere like what to do. So I've picked on the idea of kind of resurrecting the arts and crafts movement. Uh, the byline for which was uh, a democratic architecture for a democratic America, uh, small, simple houses connected to gardens. It's the kind of thing that can be done locally, uh, despite the fact that things are falling apart in most localities. Uh, so it's something to work on. It's a, wide, a wild card. So I've been drafting this book called Garden World Politics. Uh, and at the least, it's been a fantastic journey having to read everything and think about a lot of history. Uh, and it still seems to me like the plausible way to go for any kind of humane future. Uh, I'm fascinated by what a, a high tech solution to climate change would look like, uh, but I think it requires an authoritarian centralized government uh, and I don't wanna go there. So that's kind of the framing of my thinking. Mm -hmm. um, I, had, I, I know about arts and crafts, but I'd never heard that lovely tagline, a democratic architecture for a democratic America. That's really, that's really cool. Yeah, and if you go to many small towns in America, there are craftsman houses that were part of that movement and of all things sold by Sears and Roebuck. Yep. And their tools division, their hardware division was called craftsman. Yep. Uh, and I love the word craft. So, and those houses are still among the most attractive in many small towns. Right. When I lived in Berkeley, in the North Berkeley Hills, I lived in an Eichler style home. I was renting a, an Eichler kind of home. And, uh, Joseph Eichler is in it as a really interesting architect who built a lot of sort of glass and wood structures. I was extremely happy that I didn't own that house because it was like a termite trap and there were raccoons living under the house. And boy, that was just a, and I had branches from the beautiful yellow pines and other trees that were on the property. I had uh, several of them break through the roof and uh, skylights and stuff like that. So happy to not be there, but the house was gorgeous. It was really a lovely place. And I lived in a Maybeck house when I was a grad student in Berkeley. That was the most extraordinary experience. Um, cool, thank you, Doug. Uh, and, and I think a lot of us can identify with your distress about this is a, uh, a uh, as Timothy, what's his name would say, this is a hyper object, which is a, a problem too complex to sort of wrap your arms around. Uh, so where to start and what to do. And I think part of Kevin and my disagreement on the Google group uh, was about, uh, I, my philosophy is let's try a lot of stuff in a lot of places and see what works. Let's not dismiss particular strategies unless they're completely nonsense. Um, and, and so I think each of us is trying to find where to lean on the lever and even which lever to lean on and to make sure we're not leaning on a lever that's, that's like aiming energy the wrong way in some way. But, um, but I think if we can create something that can help people sort their way to productive activities in the middle of that uh, disorientation, I think that's really useful. And I wanna point out that's a real mischaracterization of our disagreement, but you know. Um, go ahead, Kevin. Well, I didn't dismiss those things. I asked if that assumption was valid and where it had been proven that videos change behavior. So I didn't dismiss it. I, I, I questioned that assumption and asked for validation of where that worked. Um, uh, to which I answered with some evidence and you came back and said no. And like the daisy, daisy 
nuclear bomb. I didn't say no. I mean, you're you're still mischaracterizing me as saying no. I still challenged, you know, some of the evidence and and where it worked and where it didn't work. Sorry, I'm mischaracterizing you by saying that I thought that you were you were dismissing the usefulness of short videos. Were, Were you not? I was asking where we could say they work other than like, uh, it gets better. What, in, in what way around complex issues have videos caused behavior change to happen? Where you were assuming that I was trying to suggest that little videos might actually solve complex issues, which is nowhere near what I was suggesting. And, okay, I mean, we can go back and forth and you will say, I, I said it was wrong and you know, it's it's not a, I'm not being uh, characterized uh, correctly in in your memory here. So I'm I'm. You know, but isn't that is that the art of communication, right? I mean, if we find ourselves mischaracterized, is that the the fault of the person listening to us, or the person of us, or ourselves in in structuring a communication that is misunderstood? Right. I mean, it it really. So so my my I mean, having gone through a career of. Uh, um corporate life where many times i had to learn the hard way how to communicate properly <laughs> and because my background didn't prepare me for that uh, i mean there's something to be said to be sensitive and cautious and and uh you know and and empathize with the with your listener who completely misunderstands you and not double down and on 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 miscommunications i think that's really the crux of it but at the end of the day, we had a wonderful communicate, a wonderful conversation coming out of it that actually enriched the topic. So it's all good. Um, yes, and um, I think it's our mutual responsibility to figure this out, to to sort of move toward the middle and sort it out. And I also think that understanding how these things work in our community is important for our community, so that we understand better how to approach these difficult topics in a way that's productive, uh, in a way that happens. Uh, yeah, Phil writes in the Mattermost chat, there's unfortunate historical examples of propaganda videos causing behavior change, like the Daisy nuclear bomb video that, uh, uh, that was dropped back in the 60s that was like, like deeply affected the political campaign um, and for the Democrats, right? It, uh, it basically, the, the video basically said, if you elect Goldwater, uh, he's gonna just go drop the bomb uh, and we'll all be in trouble. Um, I did it into a Southern um, video project that was really effective. It was women get, trying to get registered to vote when they were known by the families of the registrar and how's your mama and them, et cetera. And then they could, would not get uh, uh, approved otherwise. Videos can work for simple choices where you do this. I, I, what I was asking is, can, can we look at uh, where it works for a complex issue like climate change? Um, Awesome. And I was treating videos as a gateway drug, if I can misappropriate a metaphor, uh, thinking that sometimes short videos can be very activating, just activating, which means they might cause somebody to go talk to somebody else or go Google something or go join a movement or go whatever, whereupon we get much more complicated ways of solving or tackling the issue. So that that was all I was looking for. Um, And I was aware that a lot of my vocabulary is informed by things I've watched online. Like, like uh, I've, I've absorbed these things and I refer to them mentally, like, oh, there's that. And it's, if I can drop something in your mental visual vocabulary through one of these little vehicles, that's really powerful. That's interesting. Um, and it doesn't solve the problem, but it might actually contribute to it. So that's kind of where I was heading. If no, one has a unified approach to complex problems, then uh, it could be broken down into bite-sized pieces of which video is just one means of communicating that. But the, I, I see the issue as being breaking down a complex in- issue into right-sized pieces and understanding how those pieces unify together. And in that spirit, Tony, one of the things that I've done a lot with videos that I, that I want to do more, but it's difficult because it takes time, is tell a story in small nuggets where I try to design each nugget to be self-sufficient. I got a, I put together a presentation for a VP at a uni, uh, what's it called? Airbus, Airbus on that in the last couple of days. If you want, I could send it to you about, it shows it's a candy, it's a, it's a simple two person candy store that does a series of operations or tasks and how we break it down and partition it and could use that to communicate in right size chunks. So I, I could send you that.
Love that. If you uh, if you can share the link with everybody, that'd be awesome. Um, but also the the movie One Hundred Beating Hearts. I think Ken uh, sent it around again. I have posted this on Systems Thinking Network you know, on LinkedIn uh, of all places because there is a a it's a wonderful story that explains systems context. And I had several people comment, this is the best video I've ever seen in my life, because here you have people who don't know anything about agriculture, don't know much about the food system, but the way this farmer was telling his story, it's just, wow, the lights go on. So it is absolutely possible to, to, to have this, this kind of story format. Uh, and, and it's a 10 minute, 10 minute video that really moved some people. Mm -hmm. Um, Where do I send uh, this to? I, I, I haven't done anything like that in a while. How did, maybe offline somebody could tell me how to send it in. Oh, sure. Well, there's the, there's the Zoom chat right here. <clears throat> and Tony, I don't think you're on the Mattermost chat. Are you in Mattermost? I uh, I don't know. I haven't I haven't been actually on it for quite some time, but I think I might have a, a login for it. I don't know. Cool. So um, if someone can repost the Mattermost chat link in the Zoom chat, um, then Anthony can quickly find out whether he can make his way into the chat that we're looking at right now. We're trying to use uh, we're trying to use this Mattermost chat as a persistent chat across our conversations. Um, uh, thank you for doing that, Craig. Um, and good. So let's go back to our queue. Let's go, um, John, Stacy, Phil. Thank you, and good morning. Um... Wow, uh, the, the stuff I'm working on, you know, in 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 my background, it's 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 sort of pre-shareable at this point. But uh, I, I'm I'm part of an ongoing conversation around identity, digital identity, self-sovereign identity, and all the intricacies of trying to both do that in a responsible fashion, enable things like cross-border COVID verification, and at the same time not empower. Um, uh, an overly centralized, over authoritarian uh, approach to identity. Um, so that's that's what's going on in background. Um, this conversation, I mean, the, a couple of things I like about this conversation, it, uh, a fundamental idea that's kind of underneath that, it, it, and it's already been flagged, is the idea of modularity. And I really like modularity because it um, it's chewable <laughs> you know you can talk about i mean you know what doug's talking about is a, a, a small community we 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 obviously need to open to the idea of a that there will be some pioneers who will actually create a small geographic community there will be other pioneers that will go into a small town and hopefully graciously think about doing something like this in the town without forcing everybody to you know operate a certain way, but but create an example of, of better cooperation that's also green, climate friendly, etc. And what we're still exploring is what's the trade-off between virtual community and, and real world community and how do we make that interface um, proactive in terms of um, its, its beneficial effect on these big issues that, that we're concerned about. So that's my my check-in so far. Thank you, John. And the the um, the whole self-sovereign identity thing is, on the one hand, really necessary, and on the other hand, so complicated. And and all by itself, self-sovereign identity is not a thing people will go jump over and pay money for, or or even change their behaviors for. So it, it has to somehow be buried in the infrastructure we end up using, or buried in other use cases and other kinds of value, and that's just hard. And so. Yeah. I've been watching the Internet Identity Workshop three years, and uh, Kalia and Doc doing those, and it's like yeah. really, it's a it's a hard thing to 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 succeed in. Yeah. So just to finish up, I, I'm working closely okay. with Kalia on that and um, editing her writing, which is an interesting challenge. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but again, to, to link it to the idea of modularity, I, I they're not you know I to the extent that I have any input, I would urge. You know specific applications. There are some already um, for high high authentication professions. Ones you wouldn't might not necessarily think of, like people who work in uh, Las Vegas. They have to be multiply authenticated, 
uh, lots of and, and repeatedly in lots of different ways. Uh, and so they're like a prime candidate to that's the money is there to, to, to set up the self-sovereign and do it at the other extreme, uh, you know, a foundation could look at the question of, um, okay, we have these refugees and they're, they're, they're leaving a government that's trying to kill them. So they're definitely not going to get identity from that government and they have obvious needs and it would be in the interests of, well, most countries, <laughs> most responsible countries would like better confirmation of who they are. A few would say, no, no, because if the more you, the more definite you make who they are, the more complicated it is for us to just reject them. But, you know, it seems like there, there'll be a, there'll be a way to explore that. And I hope that that becomes a modular application. There's a question uh, in the chamber from Gil about for us civilians, can someone explain self-sovereign identity, which would be good. And, but, and by way of doing so, I'm puzzled about the Vegas example, because for me, self-sovereign identity is that each individual actually has sovereignty over their info. And in Vegas, that doesn't seem to be part of the formula. What you want in Vegas is like triple lock, super secure verification that you are you, which means if I have to take a biopsy every time you come through the door, I'll do that. But but not that the that that you want the dealer at the table necessarily to control their own info or does it? Well, the application that was uh, proposed, the, I, 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 and I only I only heard about it at the proposal stage, not at the execution stage, was to give the individual. Here's the thing: you have a locker, you have a digital locker. It doesn't matter where you. Amazon can have it, Google can have it. it doesn't matter. It's it's almost like a blockchain because. You can't really do much with it if you hack it because it's got it's all the different parts of it are differentially encrypted. So it's not worth it for the for the Russians to hack your your locker. And what does your locker do? Well, it allows you to select what it is you'd like to reveal to who to the entity that's asking. Uh, Judy, do you mind muting? Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. Okay, so um, you you have a wallet and you, and your wallet has a lighthouse on it or a you know a gatekeeper and the gatekeeper can say oh you want some information about so and so who's asking oh well you have the right to have this information and, and not any other information so we're going to take that information off their driver's license but we're not letting you see the driver's license that's the self sovereign part the part that says you get to you get to see what the individual has decided to give you. It's a, the example that's used a lot is uh, you're going into a bar and the bouncer is going to check your driver's license. And by handing them your driver's license, you're revealing your full name, full address, you know, like all this info about you that's unnecessary. The only thing the bouncer needs to know is, are you actually old enough to be in this room, which is what self-sovereign identity can selectively reveal. Right. So that, I mean, that's an easy to understand example. Uh, only made, you know, it's only the triviality of going into a bar that, it discounts some of the power. The other way to think about it, I don't know, you know, this is a whole discussion. Uh, you can look at what India did as a non-example, as a counter-example, and, and what all the negative consequences of that are. Um, but, you know, I mean, this is a topic. I, it, it, it's too big to, 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 I mean, I can answer questions about it, but, but I don't want to, you know. So India has a national... That's okay. Um, this is interesting and useful, I think, for us as background. India has a national ID system called Aadhaar, which yeah. I'll put a link to in the chat. Um, and Aadhaar got hacked basically early on. And you can go to a bazaar in India and buy a CD-ROM with basically India's Aadhaar IDs and biometric signatures on it, I think. That's yeah. at least, that's at least uh, what's been said. Um, and that just royally sucks. Like, that's really, really bad because they were trying to create a way of sort of like more than a social security number, more than a more than an ID that would let people have bank accounts and be identified for government services and all that. And now that information is just on the loose. Yeah. So it's kind of a, an example of how not to do exactly. how not to do an identity system for a country. Right. Um, so thank you. Okay. Um, let's go Stacy Phil Neal. So I found the email conversation really rich. And I hope that at some point we could have a call just focusing on that. Um, I do want to say, as myself, who is a woman, 
I found the beginning of this call really overwhelming. Um, in the email, it was easier for me to participate. Um, here, I got, I really had like an emotional reaction. One of the things, so now I'm going to say what, like something that a woman might have focused on in that conversation. I wasn't, I was focused on my, my inclination is to look for strategies that encompass all other strategies. That would be the conversation for this space. But as a woman, if there were more women in the room, what I found interesting was something that I will just say someone said, <laughs> they could identify themselves, how they expressed how in the past they had stopped moving forward on, a, on an idea because someone else had kind of threw a block in there. And I think that's something that happens to a lot of people, but especially to women or anyone that, you know, is coming from the bottom up. And with that, I'm complete. Thanks, Stacey. Sure. Um, I appreciate that and want us to focus on that over time. And not sure I want to open that can again right this second. Um, and in particular, um, I like sort of the the peace and collaboration we're having right this second, which is uh, which is good and fruitful. Um, so let's go um, to Phil, Neil, and Julian. Um, thank you very much for sharing, Stacey. I, I'd also just to to say I've begun to work with OGM in a kind of admin and operations capacity. Uh, so I'd love to talk with you offline to discuss further how we can be kind of more welcoming and more inclusive of, of those types of conversations. Um, one thing I, I had a conversation yesterday, I was a part of a talk yesterday with a group that was talking about the creation of a, of a virtual, a virtual nation. Um, and it kind of Jerry, reminded me of, of your Ted talk about how we have these structures of education that we just kind of adopt. And their premise was we have these structures of nations that we kind of just adopted based on geographic, um, lines basically um and their idea was to try and build a, a virtual um nation based on principles or, or shared ideals people who want a regenerative culture people who want um to, to impact climate change and they're in a very initial stage but i think it could be a good group for ogm to work with moving forward um yeah i'll just sounds great <clears throat> um thanks phil and um well i'll i, I have a list of ogm neighbor communities which are like other groups doing great work around the world on everything from dis dialogue and discourse to revitalizing cities to um, uh, whole ideas for how to restructure the world to game B to whatever. And a piece of what we've not gotten ourselves together to do yet, which I would love for us to do, is to reach out to some of these entities kind of in the lowest hanging fruit mode. Like, hey, these people are really like on a parallel path. And, and what does that mean we offer them and how do we approach them and what do we do? And just to layer on top of that, for me, the, the most urgent of those are uh, people not like us, uh, people of color and people in marginalized communities who don't have access to things. How can we reach out to them and be helpful to them? And they could probably use the most help and they have the least reason to be involved in an abstract discussion, but they have a lot of usefulness for probably the wisdom that's carried in this room. Uh, uh, you know, brought brought in service. So I, I would love to do that more. So thank you. Um, let's go, uh, Neil, Julian, Kevin. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's been a little while again since I last saw you. I missed the first part of this conversation, so didn't pick up the details, but I did pick up a bit of the flavor. And it's been the sort of thing that's been bothering me in the last week as well, after a couple of social media encounters. Um, there's a lot of trauma out there. Uh, and a lot of trauma can be easily pointed back to somebody who looks like the one that traumatized. And so if you speak out in a social media forum and it doesn't connect in the way that it was intended, then you've got a problem because then you have to start defending yourself or trying to clarify yourself. And the more you do that, the more you dig yourself into the hole of looking like you're mansplaining or you're explaining or you're doing something else or you're reverting to form and it ultimately ends up uh, in the worst cases in cancellation, canceling. Um, the self-cancellation, I think, is really uh, an interesting uh, space to be in because it actually means that you're taking reflection very seriously, looking at yourself and saying, is there something I could have done differently? And in the last couple of weeks, I've been really seriously thinking about, as a change agent, given what I picked up some of the stuff about climate change, 
if nobody goes to uncomfortable space, nothing changes. And so how do we stay in the uncomfortable space long enough for a new pattern to emerge? And part of me doggedly stays in there, especially if I've caused a disruption, long enough to see whether a new pattern can emerge. And on one occasion in the last two weeks, one of those conversations did turn around an initial spiritual meme posted completely out of context became, uh, without any comment on it, became a one page post which integrated some of the stuff which was coming up in the conversation, which wouldn't have happened if I hadn't challenged it. And this is the challenge, and I think John was pinning this down pretty well, John Kelly, in his comments. The online community, which is a diaspora of people who might share a common interest, but they're still in an undifferentiated group. They have different levels of consciousness, different worldviews, different levels of understanding, different pretend roles in the world, different ways of showing up. They're not real people, right, until they show themselves. And they can't show themselves until something prompts them to say something, do something, be something. Otherwise, you're just playing with uh, an anime character, right? And so these situations where we get ourselves into are the real situations. And this is the work. Some of us have to go there to create the discomfort and not be cancelled to hold it long enough to say, did you see this? And we can't guarantee the outcome because we don't know who's going to get it and who's not. And you won't know that until after the event. Right. So I saw a wonderful little table recently that was posted on the peer to peer group. And it was came came initially, uh, interestingly, from people we know from here, uh, Lauren uh, and um, Charles Blass. And it was around brave space. And in that case, it was much more about identity and, you know, showing up as a transgender in an unsafe place, etc. I'm very, very keen to see how we show up with different levels of knowledge and understanding about the predicament we're in that has no solution, which is eco-social collapse, and we're in it. How do you actually put that on the books to have a real conversation about it when most people are in, oh, don't worry, it'll be okay, we're all one, or don't worry, techno utopia will fix us all up, or, and so there's multiple perspectives. So I'm looking to rewrite that table to help to frame and introduce some of the conversations that my partners and Bill and here and David Jago, facilitator in Australia, want to have around and now what? Now that we know this, and now what? So stop pretending it's not happening. Right? If you don't get it, right? so there need to be things like warnings on the door. There need to be maps that say, beware there be dragons. There need to be menus on the door. If you want to come in here, recognise this is the restaurant, this is what we serve. But don't blame us for serving you what was on the menu. Right? And so we have to somehow get to a space that's safe enough, right? not safe, safe enough, because otherwise change will not happen. And I'll leave it at that, but I hope that fits in a bit of what was being said here. And I'm working with a couple of people in this group to, to address that and to see how we bring, I guess, the, the ethical underpinnings and the ethical principles required to hold safe enough space, which requires a different level of cognitive complexity, a different level of depth, a different level of worldview than what most of the population is capable of doing. And it's not hierarchical, it's pure recognition of the way reality works. Right? And we have to work out how to do this. And if some of us can't go there, nobody's going to get anywhere. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's go whoops, to Julian, Kevin, and Judy. Uh, so I don't have much of a check-in for the last four weeks. I've been dealing with a double attack of vertigo. It's really hard to concentrate for uh, any long period of time and I haven't been able to get any work done. But I'm hoping this is going to resolve soon. And uh, following up on what Neil just said, since my goal is to actually build working knowledge management systems, uh, one of the application areas I want to do is something that will make people feel uncomfortable and not in the way that you stare at a screen and you see all these graphs and charts that say all these dire things are going to happen, but of using technology to bring it home, to make it a visceral experience that we need to be uncomfortable and to do something about it. So uh, I look forward to doing that when I can look at a compiler again. So. Mm. Julian, uh, Microsoft Teams is really good at making people feel uncomfortable. 
Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> Julia, I imagine you're speaking from, from uh, real experience if you've been uncomfortable with vertigo for the last month. <laughs> as long as it's not, not that sort of sensation, I reckon you might have a go. <laughs> no. I've also found Microsoft Teams to be very comfortable and one of the best um, all around group where when it's well designed and well led. So I have a much different experience than say Kevin might. Yeah. I can't get it to work on my iPad and I can't get it to download on my, uh, my laptop. So I use it by phone. So that's just mine. Well, yeah, uncomfortable though. I don't think I was speaking literally and, and literally yeah. making people vomit, but rather feel that there's a, a situation that they can't just look at that. They need, we have to realize that they are in it and need to do something about it. It was just a cheap little joke. <laughs> I'm with you on it though. It's, um, thank you, and I just I just want you to feel better soon, Julian. Um, um, it's a weird irony that you deal in three dimensional stuff, which is a more spatial sort of thing, and you're having vertigo attacks. So, um, so I'm trying to make some good use of it because you know part of my research is in how to leverage the human cognitive system and build interfaces to it. So going through this experience has given me some more data points for that, the hard way. The hard way, exactly. Um, thank you. Let's go, Kevin Judy Bentley. Hey. Um, yeah, I've just come back from. Uh, uh, you're cutting out on us. Well, um, now, it's, now it's better. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I've come back from a pretty extraordinary time in the Mississippi Delta with a, a group called the June Bug Society, kind of a, a literary historical society looking at confronting Mississippi's past. Uh, you know, on race, one thing that Mississippians are different is that racists don't lie. And so if you speak up, you have to stand up because you've already taken the business and social and, and uh, all the other costs. And when, so when I moved out to California, I discovered that coastal liberals were not at all reliable because they would say things and not do things. And so this group, you know, you know, we had our uh, Mississippi has one crazy, mean, and dumb senator, and she was not there, but the guy, the guy was there uh, who he helped get our flag, uh, the, the stars and bars, the rebel symbol off the, the flag, but that used up a couple of years of his social capital. And he wrote a really strong thing about Emmett Till and the lynching that was there. We were there to lay a stone at the uh, and, and inter uh, Billy Joe McAllister, who jumped off the Tallahatchie Bridge on June the 3rd, and uh, also visited Robert Johnson's grave. And I think, you know, it's a, there, there's, a, there's a resolve to, to face the past, you know, that I think uh, places with the most benighted history can do that, uh, you know, again, I, I, I just was shocked when I moved to California that people would say good things and not do things. And, uh, that is just how unreliable, you know, coastal liberals are in, as, as a class. <clears throat> Whereas, you know, if a Southern is speaking about race, he, he or she is usually telling the truth because uh, they're against the norm. Uh, and, and so, uh, so we're looking to really do something uh, with this. And we, I, I wrote a piece that is being distributed among uh, folks working in the criminal justice system and stuff on the cost to white folks of, of uh, the bargain uh, that the Baptist preachers did in preaching to the slaves owned by the Anglicans. They had to say uh, that Exodus was spiritual. It didn't mean let my people go. And they couldn't mention Jubilee, the, the freeing of the slaves or the uh, forgiveness of debts or stopping intergenerational land grabs. <clears throat> and because uh, they thought those were dangerous. And what it, so it made the, the poor whites complicit with the plantation monopolists and what the cost of that has been. That is in uh, Heather McGee's book, Some of Us, that is, it explains it really well. So anyway, it's gonna be distributed among the criminal justice folks in, in uh, working in that in, in Mississippi and some other places. It, it's a pretty interesting thing happening. Um, and Kevin, I love the story that you told on the Google group. Thank you for, for sharing that. And I'm like, really would love to figure out how to help create more situations like that and help people move their audiences themselves and their audiences to these new places. Um, I must pause for a second and say, okay, so 
all coastal liberals are undependable. That's interesting. No, that's you, not what I said. I, you just kind of said that. Anybody else want to raise your hand if you I heard said. that? Again, Jerry, you are mischaracterizing and making what I said is a total thing. I discovered that they are unreliable because coastal liberals will say good things and not do. I agree that some do, but you just made a blanket statement. Kevin. I did not. I did not. I did not. I heard it. You are mischaracterizing me again, Jerry. I'm not sure. Kevin, if Kevin, me. listen to other people on the call for a second. Would anybody else like to chip in? Gil. I heard you say coastal uh, liberals are unreliable. Say blanket generalization. Several times. Uh, Gil, go ahead. I, I, I heard a, a broad statement, not a blanket characterization. They're different to me. I don't make blanket statements like that anymore. I, I'm like most or some, I, I put a qualifier word in there so that people know that I'm not saying that everybody who lives on the coasts and is a liberal is undependable, it, which is a general statement. I would kind of agree with Kevin. So this, okay. is, this may be a self-sovereign identi identity thing, but I don't hear Kevin as saying it as a blanket statement, whatever, the, whether he put the qualifying word in or not, because of what I know of him, I didn't hear it as blanket. If it was a stranger, I might've interpreted Jerry the way you do. And I'm not definitely I, not. A I heard it as an observation of an experience that surprised him when he came to California. I didn't hear it as a blanket statement. That's why we went in on the call. So, so this is really important for the discussion that we've been having and that who was it? I think Klaus said earlier, which is how do we have conversations among people who don't just disagree, but who experience the world in different ways. And, you know, we have, you know, Kevin is speaking out of his interpretation of his experience of other people's interpretations of the world. And we're speaking out of our interpretations of what landed in us from what Kevin said, which for none of us is exactly what Kevin said. And that's, you know, that's sort of the reality of how we live as human beings in the world. And it's damn messy. And here we are talking about hyper objects, which makes it even worse. And we started off by talking about, you know, can, vid can videos move hyper objects? Well, fuck no. No one thing can do anything with that. So we're in this, you know, in this swirling intertwingled field. And um, I don't know, I'm a little uncomfortable, Kevin and Jerry, with both of you, that there's a charge on the conversation. I don't know where it came from, but it feels, feels weird to me. Uh, Neil? I could just kind of... I think you somebody, somebody posted a quote a couple of hours ago. Uh, it may have been, a, uh, Ken Homer, I'm not sure, um, by Francois Garagnon. Between what I think I want to say what I believe I'm saying, what I say, what you want to hear, what you believe you understand, and what you understand. There are at least nine possibilities for misunderstanding. <laughs> and, that's without, and, and that's without the combinatorics of it. <laughs> exactly. And this links into what I was saying earlier as well, in that in, in an asynchronous Facebook comment where, where I was involved, um, the interpretation changes over time because the context has changed. And in this particular case, even the post changed over time. And so, you know, whatever snapshot in time, the interpretation you take, if you haven't taken the context, which is what Klaus was saying, context is so critical. And that's my point that if we can't hold safe enough space for us to have a collectively shared context, we cannot prioritize, we cannot find collective ways forward because we actually have a different map of the world and especially if you're starting with an undifferentiated audience but I'm, I'm also sorry to see that that charge is in the room but I, I understand it maybe it's hitting everybody maybe it's the eclipse but um, I know I've certainly felt it <laughs> and that's why I expressed it and obviously it's already in this room as well but yeah thanks thank you Kevin go ahead Kevin you unmuted so I figured you wanted to step back into the conversation uh, you just remuted yourself. <clears throat> Did you ask me to respond? Yeah. Uh, you don't need to respond. I just felt well, that you wanted what, to. Suspect. What I can say is that, you know, my universal experience of white Southerners is that when they speak about race, they are reliable because there is a cost to be on one side. And when I talk to uh, coastal liberals, they are not reliable in my experience because they are capable of saying one thing and not doing it. And so I'm, that's not a blanket statement about all coastal liberals, it's just that there is a cost for expressing their racism that is hidden, covert, uh, implicit, or whatever. And so they don't, so they, they've learned to say the right things because there is a cost for not saying, being on that side, but that they, that they uh, do not therefore step up and do things. And so when I say reliable, it means I cannot tell whether they are somebody who 
speaks and does or just speaks. Which is an observation I appreciate a lot. Thank you. And that's what I was saying before, but you mischaracterized it. The third time I heard all what coastal liberals are undependable, I never I, said my, all. there was a fuse that just went off in my head. Yeah, you heard the word all and it wasn't said. You know, that's just, that's how you're interpreting what I'm saying. I'm getting tired of it. Uh, okay. I, I, would, I would just say, uh, so I have, a, I have a friend, a Columbia, she's Columbia educated, uh, came of age in, in New York, and she went to for Teach for America in Clarksdale, Mississippi. Um, and she shares that kind of realization that people have this bias towards things that happen in places like Mississippi, where they say the right things, but don't actually act upon it. Um, so, Kevin, I do see where you're coming from. I, I, I see both sides of it, but I, I do see where, where you're coming from. I totally appreciate your point, Kevin. I, I, I think that's like, like deep. Um, let's go Judy Bentley Paul. Um, I'm going to be really brief because it's it's constant sort of thing, but almost every organization I'm working with is trying to deal with different diversity inclusion issues, and they're coming at them rather differently. Some are working, some are not. Um, it's heightened my sensitivity to things that happen in conversations that um, shut people down. So Jerry, I, to be honest, I was bothered when you shut Stacy down because last week the whole focus was why is this group not more inclusive of women? And she gave you some direct feedback and you pretty much shut her down and said you wanted to stay in this intellectual realm. So just that's where I am right now. <laughs> Um, and I'm sorry, I don't, um, I don't remember shutting Stacy down in that way. Um, you said you didn't want to go down that rabbit hole today when she said that something had happened in the conversation that she felt uncomfortable with. Shoot. Okay. I will, I will go back and, and, and see what, uh, Stacy, please. In, in this particular case, I just want to say, <laughs> Again, if it could have been a little tweak, because I agreed with not going down this rabbit hole in this call, that part I agreed with. I would have liked to have heard, you know, I hear what you say. I think we should have another call on that. Because in this case, it wasn't a rabbit hole I wanted to go down now. It was actually a huge important we're in a issue. rabbit hole that I'd like to get out of. <laughs> and, and, yeah. you, and you said you said that for some other things, Jerry, of let's have a call about that. Right. But you didn't pick that up here. Uh, I apologize for that. And this is a giant issue for us. So it's really important that we do have conversations about that specifically. Yeah. And thank you, Judith, for saying that. Yeah, Judy, thank you for bringing that up. You're welcome. Um, Bentley, Paul, Dave. This whole uh, conversation I find fascinating. Um, I was thinking about, I've heard some discussion about the format of these calls and maybe it would be interesting if you know, almost every suggested topic is tabled. And when people come on and share their ideas, for a short thing that they could say, oh, yeah, I kind of like, and I'd like to participate in these. And maybe we can have a, you know, a record of what the tabled conversations are, and then um, have the people break off and have those discussions. Uh, and I do like the idea of having a discussion of kind of the brave spaces and also kind of how we communicate. Um, I, uh, I was surprised at my reaction when I made a suggestion and it seemed like a lot of people were misinterpreting it. Um, and I'm usually pretty um, resistant to that, years of throwing out stupid ideas. <laughs> um, uh, but it really triggered me this time and I just nearly like rage quit. So. And that's probably more on my side than anyone else's, but it'd be interesting to discuss how both the speaker and the listener, and we can improve together on that because yeah, language is very imperfect um, and very misleading. Um, and there's almost no way to do it right. And I wouldn't expect all the listeners to understand what I was trying to say. And, I, and hopefully they're not expecting me to say it perfectly. Um, but yeah, that's something I'd like to explore in another meeting. And then someone also kind of mentioned truth and <laughs> that triggered me, although I don't expect anyone to, to do it. So I'm, I'm a big believer that there is some sort of truth. We can never get to it, but our one of the great goals is to get closer to it. Um, yeah, so those are the thoughts that just kind of came up as I listened. Um, but yeah, a lot of my project right now is trying to, uh, for Golibot is Golibot trying to interpret people what they're saying 
in the most generative way even strengthen their arguments uh, or their discussions uh, to strengthen the, the information that they're bringing to the conversation and then kind of gather it all together in one place so that people can explore it efficiently. Um, so if anyone's interested in, in working on that, I would enjoy. Thanks, Bentley. And thanks also for personally picking up the notion of inclusion in these calls and offering a productive path forward and so forth. I really appreciate that. Um, and I think that that conversation is evolving in really good ways that there are things that we can actually go do. Um, so I, I really like that. Um, and there's a piece of me that would love to just slow down our conversations and these calls. Uh, and then there's a piece of me that wants to make it through the room because we're sort of here together and we want to hear from what's happening and so forth. So, um, Michael, did you want to jump in? Oops. I did. I did want to say um, just I don't I don't know. I, I feel like I don't know if if, uh, if something I said might have been one of the things that um, that triggered you, Bentley. Um, and if it was, I, <laughs> it, it, it's just, it, this, I was feeling very much on the outside of the, of the friction that was existing and thinking, boy, I never, I never would do that. And then I realized when Bentley spoke up that I might have <clears throat> um, in, in reaction to something which I realize now could be interpreted a different way than I meant it and and a, a snipe and I feel terrible about that right now um, but you know it's um, yeah I, uh, I I'm I'm sorry actually I <laughs> my god so sorry. let's, let's kind of hit me hard yeah, let's discuss that in a meeting. Yeah, let's, because let's, I, 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 don't, I wouldn't let that lie when you said I'm that. I'm not sure that you should take any, that you should feel sorry. I don't think it was that abuse. <laughs> it wasn't abusive at all. I, no, it, I don't think it, it, I don't, you shouldn't feel bad at all, but maybe there's an opportunity for both of us sure. to improve in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, just had to jump in there and respond. It's, Bentley, you don't let strategic levers like that go. You could have grabbed that and yanked it and yanked it and yanked it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm kidding. I've, I've got to go, guys. I'm sorry. Um, dinner is smelling very good in the background and I'll be, I'll be cut off at the knees if I don't go for it shortly. But bon thanks very much. And I look forward to trying to catch up again next week. Take Thank care. You. See you. Thanks everybody. for being here. Um, Good, I'm just making sure I, I have my list. Um, so Paul, Dave, Michael. Am I the Paul? Yes, you are, you're the only Paul on the call. There's I'm two the marks, Paul. so I gotta keep the mark straight, but there's, you're the only Paul. Okay, um, I think I'd rather pass right now because I'm still learning uh, just what their group is. And I think the main focus is climate change, but there's other things too. So. Let me just pass and come back to me. Thanks, Paul. Um, climate change is one of our issues. We're trying to figure out how to, how to break through the Gordian knot of people not being able to collaborate on things like climate change. Uh, I, one thing I'll, I'll just add is where I live, uh, I think we had the, first, the country's first fire in NATO in Reading, which is just north of here. And just south of here was the campfire that burned out paradise. And so whether you believe it or not, it's happening and it's a pretty fast wake up call. And uh, in so many ways, it's, it, we're still reeling from it. There's lots of homeless people who lost their houses. There's, um, you can just feel that climate change is influencing this very conservative area and it's just, it's closer and harder to deny. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Paul. Um, uh, just for people who don't know, Mark Carranza just posted uh, an excerpt from his note-taking tool. Uh, so this is, this is what he uses for since 1984 to sort of remember and mark and connect uh, what's happening. So 
if it's puzzling that, uh, and I believe that the numbers in front of the phrases are how many inward inbound references each of those things has. Is that correct, Mark? Cool. Um, so let's go Dave, Michael, Tony. Uh, hi, everybody. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't been in that many of these calls. I uh, usually have a conflict, so good to see everybody. Um, I, you know, it's a pretty rich conversation going on here. Uh, I was struck by something that kind of echoes some of the stuff we were, some people were talking about earlier this week, but I'm, I'm curious about this idea that like the, 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 the body humanity needs, we need, we need, uh, like you need to be able to give it a physical in some sense. I, I was, I was thinking that there's a, a metaphor around biology and that, like the temperature of humanity is high or something, you know, we, we've got an infection or something and things mm -hmm. are weird. And, and how do you diagnose that? And how would we recognize it? And, you know, I don't, I don't think we have, but, and we were talking about murders and various, why, why is the murder rate going up across in cities across the U S why would that happen simultaneously? But um, I was thinking there's another example of that, which I'm seeing in companies um, or organizations where I think there's a, maybe, maybe a power shift going on. I think we're seeing it with employment where unemployed people aren't having to seek employment so that people with companies are trying to desperately find people to work for them. That seems like a power change. But also, uh, like in my consulting firm, there's a group, there's a big battles over what, uh, what consulting contracts to take. Um, and it, it's a, a lot of it's around DEI and who, who could you work for? And it's like, there's an opposition to working for the US Senate, for example. And it's like, well, if we can't work for the US Senate, you know, <laughs> who can you work for? And it's because Tom Cotton works there, right? So, you know, there's an argument that says you shouldn't work for the US Senate, but, um, but it's a very it's a very tricky kind of thing, and so the and and there's a power if you if you decided kind of unilaterally to work for the U.S. Senate and just ignore people, then you do have blowback within the organization itself. So there there is a power you know negotiation going on, and I'm seeing this in a few different organizations of people that I've been talking to where there's just you know a group of people kind of ready to blow everything up if things don't get better, and it's like I'm not quite sure what to do with it. So. Anyway, good I think you're on the theme of these conversations and it seems like a very rich theme. Thanks, Dave. Um, yeah, and, and all, of this, all of this is happening in the middle of kind of a vigilante uh, off with their heads sort of culture where it's difficult to step into these conversations, you know, whether it's called cancel culture or something else, it's just really difficult to step into these places in public uh, and survive difficult conversations. So how might we, <clears throat> How might we help difficult conversations happen more fruitfully? Uh, that'd be a good objective. Uh, Julian? I uh, had a question for David. The reluctance to work with the Senate, is that philosophical or because of the very large labor burden of dealing with the federal government? Uh, Dave, you're muted. Uh, it, the, the firm does a lot of government work, so it's not the overhead. It's really the, you can't work for the Senate because they have Tom Cotton. <laughs> Well, there we go. Gil? You're muted as well. Dave, does that mean that they wouldn't work with Bernie? Because Tom Cotton's in the same body as Bernie? I don't get it. That was kind of the issue, right? Yeah. And so, and is it, and is it, we had, I've ended up splitting into, there, there are genuine issues, right? I mean, I think there are groups that you probably, we're not going to go work for the NRA. Um, yeah. So like there is an organizational rule that says, no, we won't work for the NRA. Yeah. But, but then there's the Senate and then there's projects in the Senate. Would you build Tom Cotton's website? Kind yeah. of. I don't know. I mean, it's, yeah. it's just messy. It's weird. Could I, uh, Please go ahead. Could I, offer, could I offer something more here? Um, two parts to it. One is uh, in, connected to what I think Jerry or someone just said before about um, the kind of conversations we can be in. I, I have found that I am Self, speaking of self-sovereign self and self-identity, I find that I'm, I'm censoring myself in social media. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, you, I'm choosing not to get involved in certain conversations, not because it's not a priority or not a time, but because I'm concerned about the firestorm that could result from the interpretations of things that I say, that mm. I think might be a useful contribution to the conversation, but I sniff that the conversation could go south or nasty very quickly. Anybody else having that experience? There's a chilling effect of this kind of vengeance culture that yeah. causes lots of us to step back and not participate. Lots yeah. and lots. It feels like there's deliberate baiting going on and attempts to increase polarization rather than come to shared understanding. And that 
causes yeah. me not to want to engage at all in the conversation at hand. Yeah, I can. So oh, sorry, Gil and Ken. Sorry, I, I um, um, was talking with Fernando last night about Bernice Reagan. I don't know if people know her. Uh, she was an um, uh, early activist in the civil rights movement, one of the songsters that accompanied the demonstrations uh, in the South in the hard times of that, and co founder of Sweet Honey and the Rock and a Smith, Smith, mm. Smithsonian executive for years. And uh, she said in a speech in 1984, at Yosemite, I think a feminist conference said, this is what, this is, that is often what it feels like if you're really doing coalition work. Most of the time you feel threatened to the core. And if you don't, you're not really doing no coalescing. Uh, I'm Bernice Reagan, I was born in Georgia and I'd like to talk about the fact that in about 20 years, this is 1984, remember, in about 20 years will turn up in another century. I believe that we are positioned to have the opportunity to have something to do with what makes it into the next century. And the principles of coalition are directly related to that. You don't go into the coalition because you just like it. The only reason you would consider trying to team up with somebody who could possibly kill you is because that's the only way you can figure out you can stay alive. So we face the challenge of finding ways to talk with and work with people who not just aren't like us, but who don't like us and who we don't like. Because without that, how do we muster the, you know, the political power and the cultural power to actually transform the world? It's not gonna be done by a bunch of us, whether in Mississippi or in Mill Valley. It takes something much bigger. And, it, and, and Bernice's point and her, her other line on this, which was one I heard from her directly, she said, um, where'd we go? She said, if you're in a coalition and you're not deeply uncomfortable most of the time, your coalition's not broad enough. So, those are great quotes, Gil. Um, if you could share them with us on the I, chat, I, or yeah. thank you, that's great. Go ahead, Ken. Ah, uh, you're muted. All these newbies on the call today. It's amazing. This feels uh, diluted compared to what uh, Gil was just quoting. I have a, a friend of mine who, um, uh, and she. We shared the same indigenous teacher and she said you know when determining whether to work with a, an organization or not she looked for what she called noble intent so she was a pacifist and she was asked to work for the air force and you know she's like i'm a pacifist how can i work for the air force and the thing was it was actually the air force hospital at the um uh air force academy it's like well these people are trying to do healing so they do have noble intent and you know when i think of working for the senate if the senate were able to convince me that they really had noble intent of wanting to to break the part the partisanship and and get to how can we serve America? I'd go in to work for them. The challenge is right now, as Gil was just pointing out, you know, there's a lot of vested interests who are clearly saying we don't care. We're in power. We're going to keep power at any cost, and that becomes a really different um, uh, approach of how do you how do you uh, work with someone who says, no, I've got the power, I'm gonna keep the power and I will keep you oppressed for as long as possible. Um, we get into a David and Goliath thing here. So I don't have an answer to that, but it's just a really interesting question. Thanks, Ken. Phil? Yeah, thanks, Ken, that's really helpful. Yeah, um, I actually for a while worked in Northern Ireland in an inter-community NGO that was based in kind of rebuilding community after, after the troubles. Um, and one massive thing for them was storytelling and truth and getting people together from both sides of the conflict and hearing each other's stories and hearing each other's truths. I think one big thing in America is there is a rejection of people's truth, tr people's individual truths and how we, how we face that and how we work through that is, is, is very important. Love that. Um, Nonviolent communication is a really lovely, terribly named and really lovely process of trying to get people together around difficult issues. And one of the magic properties of NBC is that it requires that each party hear and then mirror back to the other party what they think the other person said. Not that they believe it, they're not agreeing. It's just that can they can they mouth back to the person, this is what I think you said, to, to the point where the other person will be like, mm, that, that's what I said, so I feel heard. And the act, the act of having your brain filter and then speak those words seems to soften people a bit toward each other and get them a little bit closer. And I love that about it. 
Um, and I'm wondering how many more places we can build that into uh, human activities. Uh, because if, if I hear someone's story and can tell, you know, can express it back to them, I think that's really important somehow. Because sometimes, some, you know, we see Sally Struthers asking for donations for the small starving child in, in some other countries so often that we get immune, we get numb to the world's, to the world's difficulties. And it's these stories when they feel personal and close that change us. And there's a bunch of, there's a few stories of, uh, you know, families that were vaccine doubters or sorry, coronavirus doubters until coronavirus wiped out a piece of their extended family. Uh, and that came too close to home and changed them a lot. On the Senate, I had a friend who was on the Senate staff when they passed the earned income tax credit. And he realized the Democrats wanted it to exist and the Republicans wanted it not to work and both got their way and he left. Let's go Michael, Tony, Mark. Can I, can I just jump in with one? Please pause. I got, I got into uh, a heated conversation on systems thinking that I'm not on, on uh, sustainability professionals at LinkedIn because I posted an article on Bill Gates where um, it sort of outlined how Bill Gates with his uh, uh, poorly informed uh, 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 understanding of agriculture and food systems created a nightmare for, uh, for the industry really, because he spent a couple of billion dollars uh, getting, getting these uh, plant-based uh, protein extracts into the market. He's a, he's a part owner of both Impossible Meats and Beyond Meats. You know, he's a, a founding actor in these things. He started a laboratory in Seattle in around 2004, to the, in, I mean, very early in the game, to specifically research how to extract protein out of plants and make it taste like meat. So, so he has been driving this whole thing. And so the article is very factual and the, the administrator of the blog had a total meltdown because he's working for Nestle as an independent consultant who works for you know, large food companies. And so now we are, we are in, in this, is, this is fake news, this is uh, conspiracy theories and all of that. And here, here is a guy who is supposed to administer the sustainability professional, the, the sustainability experts, right? Threat. And then you go, if you don't get it, and if you can't jump over uh, your, your, your the frame of mind, um, how in the world are we going to align you know, the professionals in the industry who, who need to process what is really happening in nature and how urgent this is? So communication and, and making it through these barriers uh, is, is an enormously difficult topic. You know? And, and uh, I posted all sorts of information for him, but it just bounces off you know, on, on because... Yeah, he, he was saying, I want to review, you know, your post with our team on Friday. And, but he was saying, uh, the, the, I want to, ref basically, I want to review your fake news on Friday. So well, don't bother reviewing it because you were, uh, so, so I don't know how to break through it, but I think if we make it actionable, right? If we show young folks or we show people in general that if you want to, your community to become a better place, in a more secure place in, 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 in the way that your ecosystem is, is designed, here's what you can do, you know, be practical, get, get, get actionable, uh, show, show ways out instead of how terrible it is, what could it be? I think we, you know, we need this visualization and then we can get out of all this conflict. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Stacy, did you want to jump in? Yeah, if I could point out why I think the, the emotional reason for that person's reaction. Um, Bill Gates has been made a demon of the anti-vaccine people. So people that have been watching a lot of this anti-vaccine propaganda see Bill Gates being blamed. And I think by using that name, it just charges people to where they can't look at what you're saying, the truth of it, without all that emotion. So the way I usually frame stuff like that is some people are buying up and then I try to create a situation where they're gonna look into it and they're gonna say, well, wait a minute, who's buying this up? Why are they buying it up? Instead of 
already seeing all the facts because we're naturally suspicious. Does that make sense? <laughs> I think so. And there's plenty of reasons to be suspicious. And then now there's lots of media to help people take their suspicions in weird, very, very strange directions. And that's, that's not working well. Um, so Michael, Tony, Mark. Hi all. Um, wow. <laughs> um, I feel like um, there's the, the 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 opportunities we've taken um, for for discomfort and well, I'll just speak for me. You know. I, I'm feeling uncomfortable. I'm hearing what, what other people are saying about um, discomfort. And I'm struck by the fact that we are like, with the exception of Phil, you know, all uh, people with some gray in our hair, let's just say, I won't, I won't put an age on it. Um, and uh, we are, you know, we are very a very homogenous group, and um, and we can make each other uncomfortable. That's really saying something. Go, to go to what Gil was saying about being in a coalition, um, and I don't know. It it just sort of. I feel like being in other rooms. Sorry, I'm 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 a little uh, <laughs> a little uncomfortable, but you know, there's something that um, Dave um, said in the chat about um, as as white males, and I I don't want to misquote you, Dave. Um, you know, as as straight white males of a certain age or whatever, maybe we should be chilled a little bit, and maybe we should. And, and you know where I took that was, you know maybe we should be going into other rooms and just listening, and other spaces and just listening and just trying to understand better. Um, and 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 looking to what actions we can take. And this you know to what Kevin was saying about uh, you know without reopening a can of worms, but about um, coastal liberals, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of virtue signaling that goes on. I'm part of it um, where we're trying to look the way we want to look to each other um, and say the things that are going to make us feel okay about ourselves and hope other people feel okay about us in this room. And, you know, I, I just, I just wonder that this, this all gets so meta that like being in other spaces with other people who are more different than we are listening to what they're saying and taking actions as opposed to talking, um, seems like a place I want to go. Um, you know, I, I value this, this place. And um, this is not like, you know, I'm out of here because of our quibbles over this stuff when we're such a homogenous group. Um, you know, I think we do each we do each other a lot of good. But I also think um, so, uh, Jerry, there was something you said earlier um, when when Phil was bringing up um, this uh, this entity that we were talking to yesterday, and and you saying, you know, that something something we should do is is um, you know in this group is more reaching out, and, you know, making a list of aligned groups and reaching out to groups. I mean, I've been in this group for a few months and I know it's existed for over a year and getting out into other 
you know, spaces, making lists of those spaces, spending less time together talking about what we think and more time listening to what other people are doing and seeing how we can support them is really, <laughs> there's, there's no barrier on that. You know, we can, we can all do that today um, and, and any of the past 365 todays. Um, so I, I'm, just, I'm just feeling all that. <laughs> and I realize that's a, a lot. So that's my check in. Um, Michael, thank you, for, thank you for carrying that into the conversation. Um, I feel that really sharply and I feel like I'm the obstacle. I'm one of the big obstacles that keeps us from actually getting things done because uh, I'm not that good at getting things done and I have this ambition to get things done and it all gets tangled up. Uh, and we've spent a bunch of time and effort, well, a lot of effort uh, in the last six months trying to stand OGM up as an entity so that it can take action on some of these things. We've also spent a lot of time in the last year plus trying to get some infrastructure parts in place so that we can see who we are and see who else is out there and then go reach out. And it's all moving way slower than I wish it were. And I appreciate uh, and am pained by uh, what you said and not, not in any reflection on you, just like you're, you're right on. You're, you're like, you're, you're right on. Um, let me go to Stacy and Doug. Um, to go back to what we were talking about on the Thank email, you. if we could, I, I'm wondering, could we just each come here with one project that we think would be worthy of highlighting? And it doesn't have to be your own. So in Kevin's case, it would be his own. But for other people, if you could just bring forward one thing that you saw, just to, just as a starting place, that would be my suggestion. Uh I like that, and I want I want us to I want to have a separate call, which I will now set up. Uh, Phil, can we make sure we do this like next week? I want to set up a call about what does outreach mean. Like like we have a long list of interesting projects already, and just just the list of things that those of us in the room are deeply already personally involved in is a great list. Uh, so we've got stuff. We just don't know what it means for OGM to reach out and be of service and try to help and connect with them and invite them in. We don't we don't know what that is, and we need to work through it a little bit so we have a tiny bit of structure and a, you know understand what is it we can offer, how do we go about doing this, and then when we have a, an interesting project, it doesn't just sort of float by on the list, but we go awesome. Who's interested in being part of the X crew, whatever we call it, the, the expeditionary force? That, that goes and, and, and reaches out to these people or who's already connected. So I'd love to, I'd love to figure out a mechanism to, imp, to, to like act on the cool stuff that's already like floating in front of us. Yeah, I think getting the list first would be the first step. Just get the list. <laughs> Thanks, Stacey. Um, Doug, then Phil. Yeah, I don't think that we are oh, such Judy, a homogeneous, I don't think we are such a homogeneous group. I think the actual differences in our underlying philosophy of life and epistemology are really deep found and full of conflict. And we have one of the tasks for this group could be to learn how to explore those differences further. Thanks, Doug. I'm Judy then, Phil. And you're muted. I was just going to comment that I actually think what's been happening recently in OGM is really positive. It does take energy to convert thoughts into action teams. And there are now all of these teams that are doing things in addition to talking about them and doing them with other people from OGM. So rather than viewing that as a frustrating process, I'm seeing it as a very generative and positive step the group's changing. But by doing that, it's changing what it means to be in OGM. And so I think we're dealing with different levels of OGM-iness, if you will. It's very OGM-y to grab a bunch of people who are all interested in the climate sustainability issues and gather up a global force of the, of the world, try to look at it and share experiences and things that might work. Um, it's just not the classic Thursday call. And so I think, it'll invite us to examine other approaches to sharing our information and communicating because the level of communication is increasing really rapidly in the last six months with all of the different things on Mattermost that you can track, all of the flow that's coming through the main OGM channel plus the other Mattermost channels plus side group channels. 
um, I'm finding that it's mushrooming kind of. So Thank I don't you want you to feel bad about it. I think you should feel good about it. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Uh, Phil, and then we're, uh, we have to wrap the call at the half hour. So we only have six more minutes and I've got a list of people who haven't been in the room yet. Go ahead, Phil. Um, just really quickly, uh, I'm working right now on the kind of role uh, and responsibilities description of this admin and ops role. And the, the very core of it is to kind of get the, kick the OGM into gear as, as working on projects, inviting people in, creating partnerships. So I just wanted to put out a call to a call for anyone who has any input. I, I can share what I have written down so far in terms of what I see as, as needs. But if there are things like engaging Stacy and Judy on, on some of more more inclusive tactics and the topics that come up in these conversations, how we how we address the topics that come up in these conversations and make them more actionable, I'm I'm all ears. And the Tuesday calls are now basically to work on these kinds of things. So if you want to um, participate in helping build out these mechanisms and so forth, please join us Tuesdays at 7 a.m. Pacific, not 8 a.m. So they're a little earlier, but the Tuesday calls are meant to be all about this. Um, uh, Stacy, is your hand up from before? Oh yes, I'm sorry. Okay, no worries. Uh, let's go Tony Mark Gill and see how, how much we can get through uh, in five minutes. Yeah, hi. I, um... Recently viewed a video uh, put on by, I don't know if people know Derek Cabrera, cognitive psychologist out of Columbia and his wife, Laura, Gerald Midgley, uh, no, Gerald Taylor and uh, Professor Midgley, I forget his first name. And man, it was it was very, very really revealing about systems thinking. Basically they said uh, they're lost. Uh, Cabrera says that, you know, he can't keep trying to get people in his program for systems thinking, just telling them that systems thinking is two, 2,800 disparate parts that don't work. People say, I can't get a job knowing that. Midgley said the same thing, that unless we could come up with a unified approach, the systems thinking, the whole career field is going to fall apart. I believe them. It's been my observation through my work experience and through years that unless we have a unified approach to systems thinking, ain't nobody going to solve no problems. Other than little point solutions, that's that's my opinion, and um, uh, you know, the, in my in my opinion, what needs to be done to come up with the unified systems system thinking has gotten entirely away from vision statements like Klaus was uh, talking about the other day, dealing with goals and how the goals all interrelate. It's all about causality, which is done after the fact, after we understand the system, then we look at the system in terms of causality, but we cannot just upfront do big causal loop diagrams and stock and flow diagrams, which is the prescribed norm nowadays, and expect to get anywhere with anything. Those things, they're not goal focused. And without focusing on a goal, we just wander all over the place. So that's, that's what the, my thought is in terms of this group doing something, if we could have success with any little, any little start off small, don't start off big, any little success on a project that presents systems thinking in a unified way, we'd rock the world. Because um, nobody's got one. Is that a bad? Tony, Tony, thank you for that. Um, my personal experience with systems thinkers, very deep systems thinkers, is that if I ask six systems thinkers what systems thinking is, I'll get eight answers. That's right. And, and, I don't, and I don't know that they're easily reconciled. I don't know that they fit together well, but I, but I think many of them, not all of them, are really useful in understanding how systems work. So, so maybe a meta system of systems or something like that, uh, that allows these things to coexist. I, so I, I don't know what tangible thing to point to, because if we let one systems thinking model rule them all and all agree to use that, many of these things have blinders and are really counterproductive. There's parts of systems thinking that are used and are used lies to benefits, but a unified holistic system um, approach is not out there. And what I'm thinking of doing is creating a hypothetical, very just barely complex enough organizational system. I've been working on this yeah. and showing the parts and how they all interrelate. If we, if we, if we come up with a unified approach doing that, we're way ahead of the game of what anybody, including these, from what I see, the leading universities have been able to put together. Yeah, and there's there's a whole bunch of practitioners out there all doing different kind of things, kind of all scattered in different directions. Um, let's uh, go to Mark Carranza, and you may have the last word in this call. Yeah, am, am I unmuted? You are unmuted. We hear you loud and clear. Great. Um, my uh, Zoom, when I click on unmute, it takes several seconds to change the... Uh, icon, oddly enough. Um, I'd like to go a tiny bit personal. I can pass for white, 
and I can pass for old and I can pass for male. And I can even pass for a system thinker. Um, I find it intimidating sometimes, especially at the beginning of this call to kind of jump in and uh, kind of jump up to the pace and the, I don't know, seemingly mm, big speaker kind of feeling of some of the participants. Um, yeah, not too intimidated, but, but I can kind of kind of feel the energy sometimes um, of this space differently from the other space that I'm familiar with, which is Kiko Lab, which seems to have many more conversations in the same amount of time. Um, I'm not sure how to create a metric for that, but I'll just very quickly say, um, healing from lymphoma, I got sick, which was even worse feeling from cancer, like an intestinal bug. And I'm like, oh my God, um, uh, trying to get back to work at the Internet Archive. Um, I'm uh, just going to pick up my computer there and take it home because I don't want to risk infecting anybody others with this bug I got. Um, boy, work is hard. Um, I'm going to have to cut back on, I'm trying to ramp up on, say, going to Mattermost and reading Mattermost um, uh, and participating there. Um, gosh, things take lots of time. One of the favorite quotes from Kevin Kelly's book, Out of Control, was that biological systems take biological time. Certainly um, for something that's under a year old, um, there are many organisms that at a year old have already reproduced, um, but there are different strategies and different kinds of evolutionary um, replication, reproduction strategies that can serve as a model for what we're attempting to do. And um, I'd like to uh, you know, think more about what those models of reproduction are. Again, biological, not so much technological or system, uh, cybernetic based um, models. Uh, I have been reading Stafford Beer, rereading Stafford Beer, Designing for Freedom. Um, it's a, it's a wonderful and highly suggested uh, uh, little document. I think it would be very difficult for people who don't have a systems thinking introduction to read, even though he's kind of trying to address a general audience. And that's my check-in and I'll try to be short, but I see Julian has his hand up. Hola, que tal? Um, Julian, briefly, and then I've got to wrap our call. Uh, actually, mine was a question directed to Klaus and Mark Carranza, which is that, First, we had uh, data warehouse and then data lake, and then we've got data fabric. And I'm wondering where does systems thinking fit into that taxonomy? Sounds like a question to take to the boards. Buzzwords. <laughs> well, I mean, systems thinking Thanks is a everybody. tool. I got to hop off. Yep, the same here. Um, gentle friends, th this has been a deep and sometimes tough call, and I really appreciate your presence, and I need to absorb lessons from this call. So thank you all. <laughs>